From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number six, recorded on June 20th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Good to see you after seeing you live last week, right? That was great. That was when you were at Penn, that was really fun. That was a live twiv that I got to watch at Penn. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I just did one uh, at uh, ASM in Houston as well. We're doing a lot of live episodes this summer. It's fun. But right right now we have uh, another uh, version of one of your posts from Beyond the Noise. It's a Substack column. And today we're going to talk about do we really need a yearly COVID vaccine? And that's because last week, June 15th, an FDA advisory committee of which you were part picked the strain for this year's vaccine. Tell us all about it, Paul. Right. So so this would be the third then formulation of COVID vaccine. So, so the first formulation, which was released in December 2020, was just the Wuhan one strain the ancestral strain, the original strain. And that served us well to protect us against uh, a disease caused by the D614G variant and the alpha variant and the delta variant. It worked very well in protecting against severe disease and in the short term, mild disease. Then Omicron hit. Um, Omicron was an immune evasive strain that sort of entered the, human, the U.S. population at the end of 2021. And with that, the, the, um, the pharmaceutical companies and the, and the uh, government felt that, that this was so immune evasive that it really should be included in a vaccine. Although even pr protection against serious disease was holding up, even with the original strain, um, certainly even if you've been naturally infected or vaccinated, you could still get a mild disease because of Omicron. So what they did then, which I think in retrospect, was probably not the best idea, was they had a bivalent vaccine. So it was sort of a half a dose with what had been previously the dose of, in this case, the ancestral strain, plus one of the Omicron variants, which was the BA4, BA5 uh, variant. Um, that vaccine didn't perform any better than the monovalent vaccine, as was shown clearly in a prospective controlled study of monovalent versus bivalent in France, as well as studies that were done by Dan Baruch's lab in uh, Harvard, as well as uh, David Ho's lab in Columbia, that there, this didn't seem to be any better, primarily because likely improved printing by including that 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 strain the ancestral strain with the BA4 BA5 that really hurt the, our ability to make uh, antibodies against those novel epitopes on BA4 BA5 i think that was a lesson learned going into what happened on june 15th where now it's not a bivalent vaccine anymore it's just one of the circulating strains the so-called xbb strain this one in this case it's xbb15 because this virus does drift i mean the data that they showed was that if you had had a recent natural infection with BA1, which is the original Omicron, or you'd had a recent natural infected with BA4, BA5, you still didn't make very good neutralizing antibody responses against these XBB variants. So they wanted to now have this as a vaccine. We would still get protection against serious disease because those T cell epitopes are still conserved. And there would, for many then, be better protection against mild disease, at least in the short term. I think what upset people in this meeting was the way that the question was phrased. Because the way the question was phrased it was, a, the, what is the strain that we're going to pick for the 2023-2024 campaign? And see, that implied that this was going to be a yearly vaccine, which may not be necessary. So they didn't ask you, should we make a new vaccine? They said, which strain should we pick? Right. That's right. And remember, FDA is a regulatory agency, not a recommending body. So ultimately, how this vaccine gets recommended or how vaccines get recommended in the future always fall to the CDC. So uh, how many questions did they present to you for voting? Well, it was really, really that may, that one question. Um, do, do you do you uh, think that we should include an XBB okay. strain? And with that, then they showed data looking at the different XBB strains to pick which was the best one. And, and clearly, this would be the best one. But I think all three were would have been the right choice in a sense. And what did you vote, Paul? I voted yes. I, I think having a monovalent vaccine that includes XBB makes sense. I guess what I would uh, worry about is that when the, the use of the word campaign implied that this was going to be like flu, that every year mm -hmm. 
we would be getting a, a, a single dose of this vaccine for, as in the case of flu, everyone over six months of age. And that really doesn't comport with the CDC's data, which is that, that those who appear to have benefited from boosters in the past um, are those who fall into high-risk groups, people over 75, people who have multiple comorbidities, um, people who are immune compromised. And that's not everybody. So that that's what I worry about is that this is going to be seen as like this year's strain. And, and, and you know, the people at the FDA said that, that this is something that the public understands. But I think that um, they what they don't understand is that when we pick flu strains, uh, we better get it right. Because if we don't get it right, a miss is a mile. And you have very f- poor protection, which happened uh, during 2004, 2005. It happened again, 2014, 2015. It happened again, 2021, 2022. And when you miss the strain, and in these cases, it was H3N2, you have very little protection, usually less than 15% against severe disease. And that's not true with SARS-CoV-2, where we continue to be protected against severe disease because of these shared or largely conserved T-cell recognition sites. So, so you always say, Paul, uh, I want to see the data before recommending anything. So what are the data which say that we should be switching to an XBB.1.5 instead of sticking with not a bivalent, but an ancestral? We didn't have a lot of data. The data that were presented were primarily by Moderna, who had vaccinated 50 people with an XBB15 at what would be their dose. So you could see what the neutralizing antibody response, and you could see at least this limited uh, subset of people what the safety response was. You didn't have those data from Moderna. You didn't have those data from Novavax. And I think most importantly, what you really wanted to see was data on uh, co-administration. Can you give this vaccine at the same time as the influenza vaccine? Can you give this vaccine at the same time as the RSV vaccine? Which I think at the end of this week, the CDC is going to be voting on for likely a a yes for uh, people over 60 years of age. So I think we, again, uh, lack data. And um, uh, what was presented to us was mouse data, which, um, as you know, you know, as we say in the world of vaccines, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. So you really want to see data in people. The ancestral vaccine, which was used for a long time, was in many, many millions of people. We know a great deal about it. We know nothing about how XBB.1.5 is going to be performing. Isn't there a possibility that it won't do as well as uh, Wuhan? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the the um, we don't have much data here. I mean, in in a, in a better world, um, this would be considered a new product because it is a new product. Mm. And I do think that that at this point in the pandemic, where um, we are much better off, we have a very high level of population immunity. And if you looked at the data that were presented to us uh, last week by the FDA and the CDC, the incidence of hospitalizations and deaths is way down. So we really do have time, I think, to get the kind of data that would be a little more reassuring that this is the right way to go. I, I, I do think uh, I did vote yes. And I, I do think that we do have a lot of data on the ancestral strain on the bivalent vaccine. I think that we have what you would expect to see with this XBB15 uh, from, from uh, Pfizer, which is you get clearly an increase in neutralizing antibodies for what has been a drifted virus from what have been the previous Omicron sublineages. All right. So you mentioned original antigenic sin, or actually you said imprinting. You didn't use the, the, the religious word um, so a lot of people have been infected and vaccinated, probably vaccinated with ancestral vaccines. It isn't giving them this, is this virus different enough that there will not be imprinting? I would think there probably still would be imprinting as a guess. I think that for, say, a six-month-old who no longer has passively transferred antibodies from Mm -hmm. their mother, I think getting this vaccine would likely induce a very high neutralizing antibody response against what is currently a circulating strain. Uh, It's very rare to find people who've neither been vaccinated nor naturally infected or both. And so I think you're always climbing the imprinting hill. The good news about this virus is that there's any good thing you can say about a pandemic virus that's killed 1.2 million people in this country is that it really does look like those T-cell epitopes are conserved. So if you've been vaccinated or naturally infected or both, you likely have long-lived memory T-cell responses that are protective. So I think that's the good news. We do learn as we go. Um, I think there is some communication errors that we made with this vaccine, Um, but I think that was to be expected in many ways. So in a, let's take a six-year, a six-month-old who's never been infected, never been vaccinated, at least with uh, with active vaccines. 
it's it sounds likely that they will make a good T cell response, but that remains an open question until we see, right? Right. You'd like to generate those data. Hopefully we'll be generating those data. I'm yeah. the, the, the proud grandfather of a four month old and I will do what I can to try and convince my uh, son and daughter in law that I think <laughs> that, that as this child hits six months of age, it would be a value to vaccinate because this virus is going to continue to circulate. It's likely going to become a seasonal winter respiratory virus joining RSV and flu and human metanuma virus as a vi- one of the viruses that cause, you know, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations and tens of thousands of deaths every year. So I do think we, we are going to continually be generating a group of people because three and a half to four million people are born every year in this country who are susceptible to this virus. And I think mm. they need to be protected. Uh, you often say you, you can't predict anything about this virus, but it could be that in the fall, when the respiratory virus season begins, that a very different uh, variant will be circulating, Right. That's been the story. I mean, you look at when we first sat down in June of last year to consider a bivalent vaccine, so June 28th of 2022, um, the data we presented was with BA1. I mean, you know, the original yeah. Omicron, that, all the data, but in, including some clinical data, were all BA1. By the time we sat down in June, BA1 was gone. And so we picked BA4, BA5, which by the end of the year was gone. And so now we've picked XBB15, and where will that virus be three, four months from now? Will it be replaced by, by similarly by viruses that have drifted to the point that neutralizing antibodies still don't protect you against mild disease in the short term? We'll see. So uh, the recommendation will likely be everyone six months older and up should get this booster. Is that correct? I hope not. I'd like to think we've learned the lesson here. Uh, first of all, when we made that recommendation or the CDC made that recommendation September 1st uh, of last year, um, people basically didn't agree because the uptake was only about 17 percent of those for whom it was recommended got it. And, and it tended to be those who really were at higher risk. Okay. I, I'd like to think that we just really follow the data and recommend it for those who really do clear to benefit, clearly benefit from a boost. But even there, where the CDC can help us is who's getting hospitalized and who's dying from this virus. Right now, the numbers are really low. So we'll, we'll see what happens this winter. This winter be, will be really instructive. So can you give a clear message about who you think should be getting this vaccine? Right. I think this vaccine should be given probably in the fall. And we'll see what the CDC mm-hmm. recommends in September to those who are at highest risk, the greater than 75 year old, those with multiple comorbidities, uh, pregnant women and uh, people who are immune compromised. All right. You can find the uh, column that we've talked about today on, on Paul's Beyond the Noise at Substack. We'll have a link below the video so you can go right there and uh, read the actual words. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Vincent.